quick question. What do these jobs have in common? Accountant, carpenter, beautician, electrician, photographer, graphic artist, interior designer, choreographer, writer, chef, seamstress. They all work in the Oklahoma film industry. And there's a place for you to join the action. Learn more about starting your film career in Oklahoma by visiting okfilmmusic.org forward slash getting started. Welcome or welcome back to the 20th annual virtual Dead Center Film Festival here live at the Tower Theater. Um, We are so excited that you joined us. This is our last workshop of the festival 2020. So um, just super excited to join that you've joined us. My name is Tava Malloy-Sofsky and I'm the director of the Oklahoma Film and Music Office and we are thrilled to be sponsoring this year's event. 20 years of just hard work and love and community here with Dead Center Film. Um, We love them so much and just um, are excited that they are bringing uh, this festival to the world um, right now. So we are also Thrilled to be uh, partnering with them on the first ever festival branded o- OFMO Film School. So um, you are in for a treat today. Our session is going to feature Sean Lynch, who is a digital uh, cinema instructor at the Oklahoma City Community College, founded by producer Gray Fredrickson, and he is going to talk to you about the intro to art, the art department. So you're in for a treat. If you're tuning in with us uh, on social media, on either Dead Center or the Oklahoma Film and Music Office's Facebook, please um, interact with us. We want this to be um, an engagement with you. Put your questions in the chat box now or midway through the instruction course with Sean, and uh, we'll see you here in a little bit to answer your questions for the the Q&A. Thanks so much. Enjoy. Hello. My name is Sean Lynch, and welcome to the world of production design. For the next 40 minutes, we will cover the basics of the art department. So what exactly is production design and what does the art department really do? Uh, so I guess maybe the best way of starting with that is what is, what is a production designer and what is their actual job? And of course, I could try to tell you that, but probably the best thing to do is let you hear from a multi uh, Oscar winning production designer, Catherine Martin. A production designer is in charge of all the sets. That is the physical environment in which all the actors perform. She sees that cow there with a crow. That cow. Which one? First cow. The first cow. Baz has a view about how he would like to see something. And it's my job to turn that vision into reality. In general, Production design tends to be something that happens after there's a script. What's different with our process is that apart from the fact that the production designer is my wife and great collaborator, Catherine Martin, everyone calls us CM, but we begin that process as the story is being written. The issues of staging, you know, how to amplify the idea of a scene through staging, is something that I explore on models with CM very early on. And then we take those ideas and we put them back into the text. What Baz is always looking for from me is obviously a visual stimulus. But I think that process comes really from the fact that he's an intensely visual person. Every single thing that appears visually in a film is part of a series of deliberate choices that Baz as a director makes. There is never just a picture behind someone's head in one of Baz's films that doesn't have a thought process behind it. There's always this kind of endless chicken and the egg thing when we start to work together, that the images that pertain to that particular idea or story start to feed the storytelling, and the storytelling then feeds the image. The reason you make drawings and pictures of what you imagine, you use them as tools to understand the physicalization of those ideas. Could this possibly have happened? What did people actually wear? What details could help fill out the story, enlighten a character? What really did happen then? What is the social context? How does that impact on the story? To get a look at them in 3D, so to speak, so you can actually say, oh, well, you know, that seemed like a good idea at the time.
That mechanism has become more and more sophisticated. We now completely and utterly shameless in our use of every kind of collage technique, whether it's using someone's beautiful hand-drawn illustrations that we then mix with photos or we recolour or we chop up and combine. Sometimes people don't even realise that we haven't built the set yet when we show them the boards because they look so photographically accurate. Obviously, I, I don't do everything myself. I have a really big team. A lot of them long-standing collaborators, like my supervising art director, Ian Gracie, art director, Karen Murphy. I have a team of 3D artists, conceptual artists who paint pictures for me, illustrators, graphic artists, drafters, set designers. I mean, there's a very large team backing me up. The person I probably collaborate with most is Silvana Azzi Harris, who's my longtime collaborator of 10 years and works with me on everything from concept collages to the credit roll. So she's the one constant that I have kind of from the very inception of the idea to putting everything to bed at the end of the day. The creative process is 99% perspiration and 1% inspiration. But that's the journey. The journey is having faith in the process that you've got to keep examining every idea you have, testing it and retesting it, tweaking it. And you've also got to know when to stop because you can overwork something as well. Wow, pretty amazing, right? I mean, is it hard not to love the art department already? Well, helping the director's vision come to reality, right? It's amazing, right? But how exactly are we going to do that? Um, a lot of directors don't know what they want until they see it, right? So we have to help them see what their vision is and be able to work through that process. Uh, and that's where conceptual drawings come in. Conceptual drawings are important uh, because uh, they are true representations of what the set is going to look like after we uh, build the set or dress the set and have it ready to go. And it's important to make sure as an art department that we are going to be able to pull that off because that is what the director is signing off, off on. And sometimes they don't even uh, go out and see the sets until they're almost ready and done. And we've spent lots and lots of money. So we do not want to have to uh, tweak those later on because it becomes very expensive. So we want to make sure that we give the director what they want then. Uh, as Catherine said, this is not just about uh, one person, right? The production designer doesn't do this all by themselves. So we're going to go to the next position, and that would be the art director, okay? The art director uh, is a very important position because uh, one of the things to think about is film is half uh, art, but it's also half business, okay? And we're balancing those all the time as kind of a teeter-totter, let's think of it that way. So obviously the production designer is a very highly creative individual, but because of that, we want to balance them out with somebody that's a little bit more business-oriented, and that's where our art director comes in. Our art director is normally going to be in charge of the crew, uh, they're going to be in charge of the budget, uh, and they're going to be dealing with what we call draft plans, okay? Draft plans are important because we have these beautiful drawings, which are the conceptual drawings, and that is what the set should look like here in the end. But it's also important to make sure we can actually get to actually build those sets. Um, so what draft plans are is they're quite different from conceptual drawings. They are uh, technical drawings, okay? They're gonna be done on graph paper. They're going to be done with uh, precise scale. Uh, we're going to use rulers on them. It's going to be important that they have material choices. They're going to have exact measurements on it. Because again, if you go out and you hand a construction uh, team a conceptual drawing, they're not going to know what to do with it. We have to give them draft plans. So the art director works to make sure that those plans are done and ready to go so that we are um, ready to actually build the sets. After that, in the hierarchy of the art department, we still have set designers, we have model makers, we have drafters, we have conceptual artists, we have visual artists, and uh, all those people are important. Uh, but again, they're a little bit larger film sets than probably what we're going to deal with in here, so I'm not really going to talk about those today. All right, that brings us to the construction department, okay? But before we get into the construction department, we need to make some choices when it comes to our sets. And then what kind of set are we going to have? And there's three options. We can have a location set, which means that a set already exists somewhere. 
we can have a studio set. That is a set we're going to build. And we're going to can also possibly have a CGI set, which is a computer generated uh, set that we would be able to use as well. And sometimes it's a combination of all of them. But the one that the construction department is most involved in is going to be the studio set, okay, the ones we're actually going to build. Uh, so they're going to be ones dealing with a lot of tools and they're going to work in a space very similar to this, okay. Uh, so uh, if you are handy with tools or uh, you like to do wood shop stuff or any kind of construction stuff, this might be a department for you. Uh, the head of the department is the construction foreman. So we think it's construction foreman, right? They're gonna be doing lots of hammering and nails and that kind of stuff. Nope, they don't do any of that stuff. Often actually in big movies, they actually wear suits. They never go and actually do any actual construction themselves. They're gonna do a lot of the budgeting. Uh, they're gonna deal a lot with the coordination, hiring of the crews. I mean, think about it. If you're doing a small romantic comedy or you're doing Lord of the Rings, there's gonna be quite a big difference in what the construction requirements are, right? So the construction foreman will figure out what our different requirements are for our particular movie. Uh, they're also going to deal with, like I said, the budgets, and they're also going to figure out what kind of materials we need, right, and how they're going to find that out. Well, that brings us all the way back to what we were talking about with the art director, and that is going to be the uh, draft plans. Draft plan can be very handy, right, because they have all the measurements and all the materials that are required, all that kind of stuff, so they can actually take those and know exactly what kind of materials we need to purchase for our actual sets. Um, so we do have our construction foreman, but the two main uh, groups of crew positions that are going to do a lot of the actual manual labor are our carpenters, okay? Our carpenters are uh, the people that are going to be hammering the nails, cutting the boards. Uh, they're going to be a lot of times building our flats. What is a flat? Well, I like to think of it as a Lego piece when it comes to building your sets, okay? It's normally either a 4x8 or a 4x10 fake wall. So when you watch your movie and you watch or your TV show and you watch Friends, for example, and you watch them in Ross's living room uh, in his apartment, uh, not an apartment at all, right? We know we're on a sound stage, just like I showed you guys earlier in there, right? You believed when I first started that I was in a basement somewhere, but then you saw as we pulled out, I wasn't in a basement at all, I was actually in a studio set, okay? Uh, and that's beneficial. So they're going to do a lot of that kind of labor stuff. So again, if you're good with nails and uh, hammers and screws and uh, drills and all that kind of stuff, maybe, like I said, construction be a place that you could find a place. And then there's also a, a, a very important position, and that is the scenic painter. Uh, scenic painters are not Joe Bob painter that comes to your house and uh, paint your walls, right? They are more artists than that. And what they're gonna do is they're gonna save your production lots of money, okay? They're gonna come in and they're gonna do a lot of what we call faux finishes, right? So they can take plywood and make it look like marble. They can take uh, styrofoam and make it look like uh, stone, okay? Perfect example is that Lord of the Rings. How much actual stone do you think there is in Lord of the Rings? A normal audience member would probably say there's tons. There's actually none. It's all made of styrofoam. We're going to watch this little quick clip here uh, and as I'm talking, and we're going to kind of see that. So again, scenic painters uh, save us money because how much to get these uh, statues uh, where I can actually make them out of styrofoam way cheaper than I could do to actually make them out of stone. Uh, so what they're going to do for us is they're going to save us lots of time. And they're not just painters, they're artists, okay? And they're going to help us a lot. And that is basically uh, the uh, small little rough of what the construction department looks like. All right, so what about all that stuff we see on sets? What is that, right? That's what we call set dressing. What is set dressing exactly? Set dressing is the staging of the space that the actor does not directly interact with, okay? We'll talk about the stuff that the actor interacts with here in a little bit. Okay, so who's responsible for all this stuff? Well, that would be the set decoration department. Okay, and that is led by the head person is the set decorator. Okay, again, a highly creative person. Think of uh, an interior decorator for film. Okay, uh, so they understand all the, uh, the things of color and space and how to put things together. And a lot of times they go on to be production designers. So if you're interested in that kind of track, maybe starting the set decoration department is right for you and if you want to end up being a production designer someday. Uh, so, uh, and exactly what is staging? Staging is making sure the space is what it is. So example, if we had a dining room, right, uh, we probably need to make sure we have some sort of a table in there, right? Because uh, again, if we took a dining room and we put a couch and a TV in there, it really isn't a dining room anymore, right? It's, it's a living room at that point. So again, can we be creative and do we have the ability to make things look the way we want to? Yes, but there is an expectation from the audience that we still understand what the space is and that is what the set decoration crew helps make happen. Uh, but again, we have 
that half business, half art thing that we talked about, right? So again, with the set decorator being a highly creative individual, we're always going to balance them out with that little bit more business person, okay? And that's the lead man. And the lead man is actually the uh, person that is responsible for what we call the swing gang. The what? The swing gang. The swing gang is a group of two to three set dressers, okay? And those are basically the muscle they are going to move all this stuff around in and out. So every single day they're going to be doing what we call dressing the set, which is getting it ready, or they're going to be doing what we call striking the set, which is taking it down and taking it away every day. So these aren't people that work on set, they work away from set getting it ready. It's normally a bad thing if you have somebody on set that's actually working there. Also the lead man's going to deal with the budget and they're also going to deal with again the hiring and the crew and a lot of the logistics things. Okay. Um, uh, but it is important to make sure we have all the stuff where it is. So again, if they're off set every single day and that kind of stuff, and again, we don't want to see them on set, uh, who's dealing with set dressing on set? Is it going to be important to have somebody dealing with that? Well, yes, because you got to think about it. If we have a large uh, uh, living room scene or we're doing a bedroom scene, do we have lots of film equipment that has to come onto that set at some point and be in that space? And again, we think maybe a bedroom's pretty big, but not when you cram uh, sound in there, you put lighting, you put camera in there. So what you're probably going to have to do is actually undress a portion of the set, and then you're going to have to redress it exactly the same way it was when we put that. So that's really getting into what we call continuity, right? And continuity is important because that is making sure that things do not change in the middle of the scene, right? We don't want a table there in one shot, and then the next shot we shoot, it's not there, and then we edit those two together, and we get a magic appearing, disappearing table, right? That's not good, because that's not reality, right? Because when we're doing our stories, we're not doing something fictional. We're supposed to be doing stories that are supposed to be real, right? Uh, so that's going to be very important. And onset dressers are there to make sure that that's all right. So they're kind of the person that's making sure what's supposed to be seen on camera is seen on camera. But also, as importantly, they're there to make sure that whatever is not supposed to be seen on camera is not seen on camera, right? So that includes things like film equipment should never get seen on camera, right? Water bottles. Or we have the infamous Starbucks cup. He's little, <laughs> but he's strong. Strong enough to befriend an enemy and get murdered for it. Most people get bloody murdered. So that's a very important job, right? And again, if you want your movie to be great, it's going to be important to have somebody that can take care of uh, the correct continuity and all that kind of stuff, right? Uh, so let's move on to uh, the stuff we actually touch. So what do we call that? Oh yeah, it's called props, right? Or property, okay? Um, so for example, if we have this sitting here, this is just a piece of set dressing, right? But as soon as an actor comes over and touches it, it now becomes a prop. And that is the responsibility of the property department. Okay, the property department is uh, headed by the property master, and the property master is uh, responsible for acquiring, managing, maintaining, uh, budgeting, uh, identifying, and uh, continuity of all props, right? And, uh, and again, when we think about that kind of stuff, well, that's simple, right? When we think about even stuff like extras, right? We think about all those background people. When we're doing that New York City street scene, Right, and we have all those people walking around. Well, the property department doesn't do their job properly. We get a bunch of people walking around in New York City with nothing they're doing, right? But if we're talking about reality, right, they would have cell phones, they would have newspapers, they would have purses, they would all that kind of stuff. So we can't just think about just what the actors themselves are touching. Okay, we have to think about what all the background experts are touching as well. Okay, so let's think about this clip that we're getting ready to watch with Harry Potter and all the wands, right? Where they're giving their uh, reverence to Dumbledore, right? And then all of a sudden, where's Harry's wand? I have no idea where it's at, right? So again, this level of detail and accuracy is going to be very important. And again, as a, uh, they don't do it all by themselves. They have their prop assistants that will help them do that. Uh, and that's very important because, again, that is a position that you could start in in film if you're interested in getting into the art department. That is an entry-level position, prop assistants. Uh, and then also, just the detail and the thought that goes into uh, just uh, an, a prop that we would think of every day. Even something that lasts only a minute, 30 seconds on camera, is going to get a lot of thought in film. Why? Because that matters, right? We don't just throw things in. Everything has a thought to it, right? So we're going to watch a scene, or a quick behind the scenes from uh, Pirates of the Caribbean. We're going to watch a little bit about them creating the code book. The pirate code book. 
Pirate Code Book was um, something when we got our hands on the script and, and I read it, you know, I thought, what an opportunity. I knew that, you know, Gore is very detail oriented and I wanted to give him options to shoot. I knew that there was things meant to be in a code book, parlay that's in the script that had to be in there. Parlay. And then the scripted line that we had about, you know, the Pirate King being able to call war. And also there was a pirate code, like Blackbeard and had a pirate code. And a few of the other uh, pirates of that time had them. And for the most part, they kind of said the same thing. You know, it was like, you know, whoever spots the ship first gets the first gun, you know, the best of the pick. Musicians must play every day, but uh, Sunday. If you're marooned, you get a gun with one shot, that kind of thing. So those are things that we put into the pirate code book. This is an actual old book that a friend of mine had. But I'm going to have these refabricated and we'll put them on this. That's what I, I like. I just want to run it past you. I think the writers were talking about something like this. And Gore's like, no, 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 it's got to be huge. These are fantastic locks. Oh, yeah, if you can go in there. Uh huh. Yeah, that's yeah, nice. So we're going to do this and this with these clasps, and then we'll come up with something cool in the middle. There was elements where leather was ripped off and the, and the binding and the wood underneath it, they, the old methods where, you know, the wood was exposed and you could see how they did it. And also there was, uh, you know, the paper, the, the vellum or the parchment that we were going to use. The paper is, is supposed to be like vellum, you know, which the original, what they used to use is that vellum is actually from the intestines of... Is it cheap? We had a meeting with Gore, and Jerry happened to be there, and I was just trying to get some information from Gore, and this is in the very preliminary stages of the book. Now this we have to work on, because that's too contemporary. No, no, this is just the sizes off. Gore's like, no, it's got to be this, and, and... There's just scribbles here and stuck pages, and... Jerry chimes in, yeah, you got to have, you know, recipes for rum. Maybe like a, re a recipe for rum in there or something. Absolutely. No. And that's what the pirates would do. They would keep their rum recipe right next to their duties of the king thing, you know? In the brothel in Singapore... Well, Singapore, you have a, a name, Rose. Z's Tavern, right. Right. Yeah. you know, and with some X's or something, right. you know. Arabic, Chinese writing. Do they have lipstick on those things? A lot of that is already in here. Where? A lot of that in, in this, with this. No, but I mean, in this page. Uh, all right. I walked away from that meeting a little beat up, and I was like, boy, I wasn't ready for that. So I said, you know what, next time I show them this book, it's going to be done. So we, I got our uh, standby painter, Tony Leonardi. I gotta get to work. And Jim Burkett, who's a conceptual artist. So usually I work right next to Gore and we sketch a lot. And then Chris Peck asked me to help on this, uh, on this super prop. We came up with some little stick figure hobo type drawings and he would do these in the corner. We would tear the book and then we would sew it back up and we'd take a torch and burn it and through the seam or something or the hole of the, the burning, you could actually see some of these stick figures or how to attack a, um, a ship, you know, or something like that. This is actually a map to the rum locker that some desperate pirate put together. Shows you how to walk 10 paces from the palm tree to the rum locker. It's probably the most valuable thing in the code book. Welcome to the Caribbean. In here it tells you who the pirate lords are, what their pieces of aid are, what seas they are a pirate king to, and the lords, and how a pirate lord becomes king. And all those things are revealed in here. It's kind of... Actually, I shouldn't even be talking about it right now, to be honest with you. We tore and burnt and took wax and took fake blood and took some sunflower seeds and, you know, rum and wine stains and, you know, everything we could think of. We kind of threw the kitchen sink at it to get that texture and detail. It weighed like 80 pounds. It's got a thousand pages in it. I feel like I pulled a tree stuff out of the ground. I've been guesstimating the weight by trying to lift it. Too heavy for a prop. I showed it to Gore and Johnny and uh, got uh, really good responses from them. So the next day, we're going to go shoot it in first take. Keith he had to open up the cover, and he had to flip, uh, I think, three pages. Nailed it great on the first take. Because by the second take, you know, 10 minutes in between, whatever, he, he goes to open it up, and he, you know, can't get it open because the thing's so heavy. So uh, he put it back down, and he, had, he said, ah, it's a movies, you know, the luggage never weighs as much. And we went back behind the set, and we took a saw, and we cut half of it out. We cut all the extra pages. Oh, the book that was constructed it was a little too heavy to open um, so they're cutting out the inside of the book the pirate movies don't come along very often so uh, you know if you look back over history and how many pirate movies have been made there's only a handful of prop masters that's had that opportunity so uh, when that opportunity presented itself it doesn't get any better than that
wow, that was pretty cool, right? I mean, who would have thought you would have spent that much time and effort on something that was only going to be on screen for one minute, right? But that's what the art department does, right? We make sure that everything is going to be perfect and real in our scenes that we're able to make sure that we immerse the audience into our world, right? That's very important. Uh, and that's pretty much for the basics of the prop department. Uh, we're going to talk about a position that works very closely with the property department, even though they aren't necessarily part of it, uh, and that is the gun handler position. Okay, The gun handler position is very important because this is a safety position. Any of you guys remember uh, the movie The Crow with Brandon Lee, and then we had that horrible accident in which Brandon Lee got killed? And because of that, this position has now become a requirement on any uh, film set that is going to have a firing of a blank gun on set. Okay. Uh, again, I don't have time to go into data all the gun safety regulations that are on movie sets, but just know that is a position that deals with uh, the gun safety on set, and that's all they deal with. They can't do anything else because, again, that is a 100% safety position. So what about those beautiful manicured lawns or those flower beds at those houses that you guys see when you look at the mansions on those TV shows and stuff like that, right? Well, how is that done, right? Well, we have specialty positions. In this particular case, we have the greensman. The greensman is responsible for all agriculture on sets. Okay, so basically if it's green and it grows or if it's a plant and it grows, they're gonna be responsible for it. And, uh, and I know that seems very specialized, but that's why movies look as good as they do. That pretty much wraps up the crew positions for the art department. Uh, probably more than you would have thought, right? I mean, there's lots of people that do that. So next time you get a chance to go to the movies, stay, watch the credits, and, uh, you know, kind of uh, look at the people that helped you create the world that you had a chance to watch. Uh, to the average viewer, uh, it'll seem normal, right? We know that the uh, spaces existed. They were what they were, right? Uh, we just walked into somebody's bedroom. Uh, that's not the way it works in the real world when we're filmmakers, right? We know we create those spaces and how we create those spaces will matter if a uh, audience member will believe our world or they won't believe our world. Uh, so based on that, uh, like Catherine said earlier, it's important to make sure that everything is there with a purpose. Remember she said uh, there was never a painting in one of ba uh, Baz's uh, movies that doesn't have a purpose behind it, right? So again, every single choice we make, everything we place, uh, is going to be very important. That kind of brings me to our uh, back to design and that brings us to these very powerful tools that I like to call the design factors, okay? And these are important uh, and there are six of them, okay? Uh, the first one we're going to have is color. Color is important. Color affects us, okay? Uh, we're going to have texture. What are things made of, right? How's that going to make us feel? Uh, we're going to have our uh, shapes and lines. And exactly how are they going to affect us? We're going to have our size of the space itself. We're going to have our, um, and we're going to have our composition, how are things laid out. And we're going to have our use of the space, are things cluttered or clean and stuff like that, right? Color theory has long been discussed, and I'm not going to get into the argument about specific color theories, but it is a scientific fact that color does affect us. For example, red is an agitating color. It's going to kind of make us stand up and notice a little bit more uh, and can sometimes cause irritation or therefore tension, uh, where we would think blue as being much more of a calming color. Uh, take green, for example. Green is uh, generally kind of uh, considered with nature, right? We consider it calming and natural and all those kind of things, but now we can start playing with shades a little bit. So as we think about it, let's take that green, that forest green, and now make it a pale green. Now it doesn't affect us the same way, right? It kind of makes us feel sick and down and all those different types of things. So color is a very powerful tool. So next time you get a chance to go out there and look at your sets or the different options you pick, think about color a little bit more. It's going to be effective for your films. Um, also, texture, very powerful, right? So when we think about texture, there are two main parts of texture. There is material choice and there's age. So let's start with material choice. Okay, let's say uh, we're talking about wood or metal or stone or cloth or any kind of different feel that way. All those different material choices make us feel different ways about it. For example, if we had a table and it was made out of wood, uh, and it was a natural dark mahogany wood, for example, we kind of think of that as being rich and wealthy, right? But we could change that to pine, and all of a sudden it's still wood, but now it doesn't feel as uh, expensive as the mahogany table felt. 
Uh, but let's go even more extreme. Let's go from a wooden table to a uh, stainless steel table. And let's say that table belonged in your house. Now, does a stainless steel table necessarily uh, belong in your house? Probably not, right? So it's probably now belongs in a lab or in a medical situation at some point, right? Uh, and then we can kind of then take that and go into age. So we have that nice, shiny, uh, stainless steel table and we think well that goes really well right into that lab situation but now we make it old and we make it rusty and falling apart all those kind of things now it really doesn't fit in that anymore right now it's on something maybe like a horror film or something like that so again texture is important so think about that as you guys are doing uh your pieces in your designs okay size can be uh, a way to overwhelm your audience or your character right so if they walk into a vast wide open space for example we can't see the edges you as an audience will feel lonely you'll feel isolated you'll feel small right where we do the opposite and we put them in a very claustrophobic or small space right they'll feel claustrophobic and that's going to cause more tension in your audiences so when we do let's for example when we do our horror films do we often see uh them in wide open spaces no a lot of horror films take place in very confining claustrophobic hallways and rooms and stuff like that well why is that because that's going to cause an extra level of anxiety in our audience so that when uh, the killer finally does come out and cause that jump scare for example it's going to heighten that quite considerably. What about our lines and shapes? Lines and shapes definitely affect us as well. Uh, because again, when we think about it, let's, uh, let's think caveman days, right? So if we think kind of shapes and lines, those kind of things, when we think of pointy things, right? We think of them as being bad, right? Why? Because points hurt, right? Swords are pointy, stuff like that, right? But when we think about circles, circles are more calming, right? It is too round on the top. It needs to be pointy. Round is not scary. Pointy is scary. So again, shapes and lines matter as well. And then we can get into our composition and our use of space, okay? And those really go hand in hand. So for example, is my space very symmetrically laid out? Is it uh, laid out sporadically? Is it cluttered? Is it clean? Are things stacked high, low, all that kind of stuff? And we're gonna take a quick example. Remember Harry Potter and the Deathly Hollows part two? We're specifically talking about the room of requirement, okay? Uh, scene in there. So we're going to watch that and kind of see exactly the choices they made when it came to composition and it came to use of the space. So what'd you think of that clip, right? So would it have been the same if it wasn't cluttered at all, if all the stacks were only four feet tall, right? It would have felt like a totally different scene, right? We get ready to have a big action scene in there, right? So what did they choose? This room's really cluttered, everything's really tall and looming and that kind of stuff. And that causes the tension in our audience and gets them uh, ready to go, okay? So again, we're gonna watch uh, two examples of uh, clips of, uh, of a movie that's pretty much the same movie twice, all right? Obviously different director, different production designer, so it's gonna be different and should feel different, right? Uh, but we're gonna look at Willy Wonka the Chocolate Factory and we're gonna look at Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, okay? And we're gonna watch basically the same scene or a portion of the scene where they basically go into the chocolate room, right? Or the big room full of candy, right? And again, we think generally that'd be a happy place. So we're gonna see how you guys feel about that uh, once we get in watching the clips. So here are the clips. My dear friends, you are now about to enter the nerve center to the entire Wonka factory. Inside this room, all of my dreams become realities. And some of my realities become dreams. And almost everything you'll see is eatable, edible. I mean, you can eat almost everything. Let me in, I'm starving. Now, don't get overexcited. Don't lose your head, Augustus. We wouldn't want anyone to lose that. Yet. 
Now, the combination. This is a musical lock. Rachmaninoff. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, the chocolate room. Hold your breath. Make a wish. Count to three. Important room, this. After all, it is a chocolate factory. Then why is the door so small? That's to keep all the great big chocolatey flavor inside. <laughs> Get overexcited. Just keep very calm. It's beautiful. What? Oh, yeah, it's very beautiful. Quite a different feel, right? I mean, Willy Wonka felt calming and uh, happy, right? And why was that? We had lots of round shapes. Uh, we had lots of prime colors, all that kind of stuff. And then let's take uh, Charlie, right? Charlie's side was we had lots of sharp shapes, right? A lot of blade-like features in that, right? Lots of uh, what I like to call hyper colors, okay? So that means uh, that things are just too bright, right? So I always like to think all the way back to Snow White and the Seven Dwarves and the Red Apple, right? A little bit too good looking, right? So that means, right, poison, right? So uh, being able to use that. So again, I think if you were to turn off the volume on any of those and just watch the scene itself with just the visuals, I think you would have felt completely different about those spaces, even though they were both candy-filled rooms, right? So, and again, Tim Burton especially is a master of playing with shapes and lines. Okay, so if you want to uh, learn a little bit how to use that effectively in your movies, I would say watch some of his movies and really pay attention to how he uses lines and shapes for his films. Uh, I hope you guys have had a chance to uh, enjoy and learn a little bit about the art department today. Uh, I do hope that uh, next time you guys go to the movie, you'll have a little bit of a new appreciation for what the art department does uh, for everybody. And I look forward to uh, having your guys' questions. Welcome back to Dead Center Film Festival 2020 for our live Q&A with Sean Lynch. That was an incredible workshop. Thank you. No problem. Thank you. Great job. So much depth. And I learned so much. I hope all of you guys did as well watching. Um, remember that this is streaming live on Dead Center Film Festival and the Oklahoma Film and Music Office's Facebook pages. And we want this to be an interactive conversation. So we have only, I think, about 10 minutes. So go ahead and drop those comments and questions in the chat box, and we will make sure we get to all of them. Um, so I just, and I want to just acknowledge too that one brave soul out there and he's leaning in his name is chris and we see you and we hear you and we need you in this industry so we're so excited that you joined us today um and just i'm um, we want to answer your questions as we go here so sean um you have so many years of experience you've done so much you've worked on so many projects with some award-winning oscar-winning um producers and filmmakers your uh, digital cinema instructor at the Oklahoma City Community College, but like that's 
wonderful on paper, but let's, our audience wants to know you and where you came from. Um, I, I loved hearing your story just a little bit here earlier, hearing how you grew up and kind of how that translates to where you are right now in the, in the art department in itself in film, in cinema. And so um, just tell us, yeah, like a, a brief snapshot of your background and your upbringing. Okay. Yeah. I originally grew up in Oregon. Uh, my dad actually owned a firewood business, so I've always kind of been a hands-on with tools and uh, just in general kind of uh, always like to build stuff and things like that. Uh, and then after high school, I went to uh, the Air Force for six years and I uh, was actually a, a bomb loader, which means I actually loaded uh, bombs and missiles on airplanes. And then I, after, and then I actually cross-trained over to being a surveillance technician on the AWACS, which is the big plane you guys see fly around here in Oklahoma, has the big dish on it. Okay. So, um, and thank I, you for uh, your service. Oh, thank you. <laughs> uh, and I kind of attribute that with kind of some of the stuff in that was very helpful in film is learning a lot of the disciplines mm, and the yeah. things like that that I needed to uh, carry that over to film. Yeah. Um, and then I actually... Actually, after that, I uh, got into film school because uh, I was kind of looking to change after the military. And I ran into Oka Triple C uh, and actually took their film program with Gray Fredrickson. And, uh, so were you stationed at Tinker? I was stationed at so Tinker. So that's what brought you to Oklahoma? It was what brought okay. me to Oklahoma, yeah. Okay. I, was, I was stationed here and I actually met my wife here and, and stayed here after uh, after okay. I got out of the military. And, uh, yeah, and then I, uh, like I said, I did a couple other things in between. But basically I kind of re-looked at my life of what I really wanted to do. And I was like, well, you know, I have a passion for telling stories. And, mm. and so that kind of brought me back to the film industry. And um, I basically, um, yeah, I went to film school, and then I've worked worked in the industry for about uh, ten years straight, uh, doing up to about twenty five films. Uh, and I continue to make films today, as all, all the instructors at Oka Triple C do. Like we all continue to do our crafts, and uh, and I, but I, I'm more on the side of teaching now. So you said O Triple C. Some people refer to it as O Trip. Um, I mentioned earlier you studied at and now teach um, as the digital cinema instructor, um, lead head of the program at the Oklahoma City Community College. Mm -hmm. Again, we use those acronyms. Yes. There's a lot of those here in Oklahoma, um, as I know there are everywhere. But so tell us, like, I know the background of OTRIP or OCCC, but you are working every day with an incredible Academy Award winning producer. Um, who who won for who produced all of the Godfather Father trilogy series, mm -hmm. Gray Fredrickson. So, and and Oki himself. What is that like working alongside him? Um, I mean, it's amazing. He's such a wealth of knowledge, uh, not only for us as instructors, but also mm -hmm. for all of our students. Um, mm -hmm. Like he is so accessible. He has no problem sharing all of his. Like I said, he's been doing it for. Secrets. Yeah, all of his secrets. He's been doing it for 50 years and, again, has won, you know, Oscars and, and Emmys and uh, all that kind of stuff. And he will just uh, pour that into everybody. And he's such a great resource for Oklahoma film in general. Yeah, absolutely. You know? And, I mean, him founding this uh, film school and, I mean, t bringing it, it must be so cool for you, though, uh, leading the art department pr program there because – he worked alongside most of his movies. The production designer was Dean Tavalaris, who's probably my favorite production designer. Um, and so we talked about we need to bring him in for a workshop um, at live at O-Trip. But um, so that's just so fascinating. So tell me about um, your movies experience as a filmmaker. And did you start in art department? I, I actually did start in art department. Uh, okay. Gray actually had a small production called Gray Mark Productions, a uh, production company, and uh, I had a chance to actually start as a prop master. That's pretty rare that you start as a key, uh, but Gray was <laughs> yeah. kind of trying to experiment. He was trying to do some low-budget horror films, and mm -hmm. so basically he asked me one day, would you like to be a prop master? And I was just starting school, film school, mm -hmm. and I said, I have no idea what that is, but yes, I do. Uh, and <laughs> sure. so basically I put in the work, and uh, I basically kind of bumbled my way through that movie, and it, I think it turned out really great for what it was, um, but I really worked a lot harder than I had to, and then I had a chance, because of that movie, to work on another film that I actually got to uh, work with uh, the person I would consider my my mentor, which was uh, Trevin Bedwell, and he was a LA prop master for years, and he actually came and did a film here called Wisteria, the Albert Fish Project, uh, and uh, I worked with him and learned how to do it right, and then kind of bloomed after that and I've like I said I've done a little bit of everything in art department I've been a prop master uh, prop assistant I've been a set decorator I've been a set designer I've been a prop ma or a production designer I've been a little bit of everything in art department and then I moved more into producing mm -hmm. and now I'm currently working on writing more than anything so, okay yeah, yeah. I, I know you are a, a professional screenwriter as well so we look forward to seeing more stories <laughs> um, coming from you but 
Um, what a fascinating job um, being in the art department. Um, we talked a little bit earlier today about how it might be a little under um, under appreciated, but I love how you said in your instruction in your workshop you said. I, you and we're encouraging people to stay to the end to watch the movie mm-hmm. <laughs> and see all of the credits and all of the you know 180 on a smaller movie to yeah. you know thousands if it's an animated picture or a Marvel movie, mm-hmm. um, all the positions, yeah. but help sort of pay tribute to the people who literally created a world for you to sit in for two hours. Absolutely. So thank yeah. you yeah. <laughs> because those people, you know, I think definitely need to be um, um, honored for that. So. Um, so I think we got a few questions coming in. We were monitoring a couple of different Facebook pages and it seems like sort of the overarching theme is like, this is cool. Like, I don't know if I wouldn't think this job would be easy. It looks fun. Like you can go shop and pick out furniture and props and like create a little world. But like, I know it's so complex. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of people that are leaning in right right now, live at Dead Center 2020, and this is our final workshop, yeah. so we're we got a lot of energy left. But where would people start? Can they intern at your school? Are there other places in Oklahoma where where does yeah. somebody get started? Other than like on our website, yeah, um, right. where where sh- how can people start? I mean, initially, like I said, I mean you can kind of take the traditional route and go to film school and kind of make connections that way. Yeah. Uh, like I said, at Oka Triple C, we have uh, we will. Tr- you know, train you in a particular craft that you're interested in, and then you can kind of tone or uh, kind of specialize that while you're at the school, and then we help you get on jobs. Uh, But if you're more interested in getting into it right now, you can definitely um, just find somebody in the industry, uh, you know, come talk, network. This is industry is about what you know, and it's about who you know. You have to be able to do both. And, And what that does is then that they can help you get on a film set. And then what I always tell my students is when you're on a film set, be the best you can be every day. Have those people walk away from that movie going, I couldn't possibly work without this person again. Mm, that's good. that good. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's good. Um, and we've heard that it's kind of the through line with a lot of our other workshops. And, you know, everybody wants to surround themselves with positive, hard, hardworking people um, that, that care about what they're doing. So I think that's great advice. And you talked about, um, you know, networking and pre, I will just say pre and post uh, COVID I would always tell students, you know, look in the production directory on our website at okfilmmusic.org. We mm-hmm. also have an incredible app, but look for the production managers. Those are the people hiring. Mm-hmm. So you could buy them a cup of coffee. Now it might be in during COVID world, it might be a virtual yeah. <laughs> cup of coffee <laughs> through Zoom. But <clears throat> um, yeah, so just to just to say hi, you know, ask somebody mm-hmm. for 30 minutes of their time. But for you, would you be willing to take a Zoom call or sit down with somebody over coffee and just tell them a little bit about like where they how they can get their foot in the door in the uh, art department? Uh, Absolutely. Yeah. Any any time. I said that's the biggest thing I like to pour myself into students and and just anybody that's interested in the film industry, because I think that we're only going to grow when we grow as a community. Yes. So. Yeah. Thank and thank you for your for doing <laughs> that and um, because I mean your school and uh, you know a lot of the other um, educational outlets here in Oklahoma, I mean you guys are key to fostering our next generation and we are in this really exciting time where Oklahoma's film industry is flourishing as you know. Mm-hmm. Um, the panel we uh, just spoke with a producer Bennett for the film Breaking Them Up which premiered at um, Dead Center Film 2020 and he was praising you and your students. And so those students, do those students, anybody that's at school, do they get to work on a set and they, do they get credit? Uh, yes, we actually do have an internship. Okay. Um, it's not a requirement to work on a film to take the internship, but, but if you do, can. you can actually get credit for it. Okay. Um, and again, like I said, our, that's that's our job. We feel we, we work as hard as possible to make sure our students coming out at least work on at least one film before they leave the program. Okay, so. great. And I don't do it. If we have any questions coming in, uh, let us know, Yusuf. But otherwise, um, 
would you for O Triple C? And I know this isn't an advertisement for them, but it's key to the growth of our industry. Do you offer? What if I am full time? You know, at working at Home Depot or Lowe's, and like this is really interested. Maybe that's Chris. Maybe that's you out there. But like. Can I take night classes or uh, online classes? Yeah, yeah absolutely. Every okay. single one of our courses offered at Truth is either offered during the day and night okay. or it's just offered at night. Okay. Uh, we, we do, I mean, a lot of our students, it's not generally people directly out of high school, I and mean, we do get those those students, and we have okay. a large demographic of anywhere from 18-year-olds or sometimes 16-year-olds mm. because they, a lot of we do get people now that are coming in and doing it while they're in high school still, um, mm-hmm. but we also get 80-year-olds that come in and just are wanting to do something different or, you know, stuff like that. And we have, you know, people come in with master's degrees that just Mm -hmm. want to change over and do film now. So I love that. And we really do hope that our dead center film festival branded uh, Oklahoma film and music office. That's a mouthful film school (laughs) that this series will help ignite some new um, interest in film. We, um, you know, there's just um, something for anybody. And I love that you said it's really for all ages. In this new world that we're all living in, if you're tuning in down the road in the future, um, we are filming this during the um, COVID-19 outbreak. Um, Oklahoma has had, um, has been fortunate. So we've had um, lower cases historically here and um, we're able to open. Our economy is slowly, safely opening back up. Mm -hmm. So we currently, while we're recording this, we've got three films in production. Um, but just sort of looking ahead, um, what what advice next would, I know we don't have the crystal ball and we don't know, but what advice would you give people um, that just, that are looking to pivot? Because I, unfortunately there's so many unemployed just looking to pivot um, um, I like, some other ideas. I always tell any student or any anybody I talk to that wants to get in the industry, just find the thing you're passionate about. Like mm-hmm. I said, and you were saying, and there's, there's a, there's a, Thing for everybody in mm-hmm. this right so i mean what what's cool i think we're or, film's its own little ecosystem mm-hmm. like literally if you're a chef you can work in film mm-hmm. if you're uh, good with numbers you can work in film mm-hmm. um if you're you know you can make tables you can yeah. work in film like it's such a diverse thing and just yeah. find that one thing that makes you excited about coming to work every day and that's going to make you do your job better and therefore that's going to make you be good at what you do it's great so the workshop was so fun. Um, little did I know that you were going to include my all-time favorite movie, <laughs> Willy Wonka. One of my so, favorites as well. So. I mean, can you imagine? You were telling me that that film made, cost $3 million mm-hmm. back mm-hmm. in the 80s. Yeah. What do you think that film would have cost today? Do you think it would have been Well, I mean, Charlie the Chocolate Factory, for example, I mean, it was what, that was about 30 to $40 million probably when they did yeah. the Johnny Depp film. So, yeah. Yeah, just much different philosophy but on different, what was yeah. important. You know, yeah. it was basically no names. You know, Gene Wilder was the only. Yeah, I kind of forgot about so. the remake because, like, the first one is like my favorite. I can't get that one out of my yeah. head. But you're right. I mean, yeah. it it. it well, and, it's, and it's a great term of you barely see kind of the same movie made twice, and that's from a production standpoint. Mm-hmm. That's why I use it because it's visually and the whole feel of the movie is different. It, and yeah. I like to say different production designer, different director, way different movie. Right. And so that's where the the vision comes in. So what other que- what other questions are we ha- having come in? Okay. Um, does someone in the art department, if they're applying for a job, whether they're new or experienced, how do they need to showcase or present a portfolio? How do they market themselves to say, this is my experience besides just a title on a piece of paper? So the question coming in from the audience is, if I experience or no experience, um, what are you, what are you looking for? Do you do I need to come with a portfolio? Do I need to give you a sizzle reel, or what do, what do I need to show you that I can do this job? Yeah, I mean, it really depends. If you're coming in at an entry level position, the answer is generally no. You come with whatever credits you have in your movie and kind of good a attitude. general good attitude. Mm-hmm. Uh, if you're going to want to come in as a set decorator, if you want to come in as a production designer, generally your portfolio matters. So that's where you'll have taken lots of good pictures and things of the sets you've done. Uh, a lot of times they'll want, uh, you know, ripped clips of the films you've worked on so they can visually see how your stuff turned out on camera. Ripped clips? Or just, just Dig- digital, digi- digital, digital reel, real wheel little clips. Show reel. Yeah, a little show reel. Okay. Um, for that, but again, like I said, it's it's it photos generally work, and they're just going to want to kind of you know, um, uh, you know, um, just do a little background on you. I mean, perfect yeah. example of that was on Killer Inside Me. I I got interviewed on that initially, uh, which I ended up prop mastering. Uh, I initially got interviewed. Uh, they wanted me to be the picture car coordinator, which had been the person who got all the vehicles. I just got a film where I was the prop master, but I also dealt with 
uh, wagons and horses and planes and cars and all that kind of stuff as well on top of that because when you go more low budget uh, a lot of times you're going to pick up other jobs um and i said well that's great but i'm actually a production i mean actually i'm a prop master and they said okay uh, <laughs> because they were a bigger film coming into town and, and, and that's something that oklahomans always i think will deal with just slightly mm-hmm. is the idea they're coming in from an la or whatever that they don't necessarily think we have the most qualified people and you just have yeah. to stand tall and say no this is what i do here's the stuff i've done and you proved it and i did that and they actually hired me on the position so. well you talked in your workshop about it's sort of like like building Legos. So mm-hmm. if you would you hire some <laughs> Lego like a kid who's had who's played with Legos their whole life and uh, wants to I mean, that, that might I mean, help. I mean, that's, I mean, it's just, a, it's a vision of understanding <laughs> how things go together. I mean, like I said, I mean, that's, that's art. Like I said, art department is, is different. Some of the other ones are like camera and lights and sound. They're very technical. There's a technicality to art department, but it's a very much a creative aspect as yeah. well. And you have to be able to deal with both. So you have to be with the logistics, but you also have to deal with the yeah. art. Because if you don't bring it's something real, mm-hmm. then people aren't going to believe your world. And maybe, therefore, it, it maybe Minecraft, the Minecraft is could be a great. good, mm-hmm. right? Because you yeah. are creating, I mean, the world that my kids have created. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. It's so fascinating, mm-hmm. but so technical. So, mm-hmm. yeah, I love that. And, um, and just you recognizing that it's it's fi- film is sort of half art and half business. There's to, th- to that point, there's so many mechanics behind it. Mm-hmm. So, well, congratulations on all of your experience you. and, um, and just the, the, the flag that you're waving for um, our film industry from O triple C. Um, thanks for everyone tuning in. I hope you learned a lot. I sure did. And um, hope you enjoyed the De- dead center film festival branded um, OFMO film school. We'll see you online.